Season 2, Episode 3, The Next Generation. For those of you who have been seeing Pure Love Talks, thank you all for your support. We took a little hiatus. Thank um, you for your patience. For my daughter giving birth. This is, let me say his This name. is Joaquin Jose Bagua a la Rivera. You know he's Puerto Rican and black. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and native. That's right. Yes. So we got a little bit of all of that in there. Um, so, uh, this, uh, topic today is, um, the next generation, obviously. Um, so, um, I'll let Mandy start off with talking about like her experience, um, giving birth to this beautiful bundle of joy. And we just wanted to have a conversation about what this all means. We've been talking to you a lot about, um, our experience. So kind of, um, looking back as to how I raised my daughter and like storytelling around a lot of different topics. Um, that all kind of culminate into um, preventative um, prevention around CSA, but also incorporates so many other things. I've also tapped into my own childhood uh, and talked about that, but now we have Joaquin here. And so it's been a long time since I've had to do any of that talking and thinking, you know, with a child. And now this presents itself a beautiful new child in our life. And so is this theory or is this practice? So we want to be sharing how all this kind of comes up for us and, you know, also share some fears and um, some revelations, right? So, well, to start off, um, I had a pretty good pregnancy, I must say, um, considering all the infinite possibilities that could happen, it was pretty good. Um, I only had morning sickness for the first three or four months. And mind you, I didn't find out until I was almost four months. So, you know, that wasn't that bad. You know, I worked throughout my entire pregnancy up until the very last second. Um, mm. I actually was in D.C. at Howard Homecoming when I went into labor. Um, and oh, and I was on the Guatu tour at that time. <laughs> yes. Um, traveling for how many weeks was it? It was like almost two and a half months yeah. uh, traveling to about... Of, uh, 14 cities and doing over 35 programs and we prayed and prayed every single night <laughs> for me to be on time and able to um, witness the birth of this grandbaby yes. and it, it just so happened that day you know we all know that my daughter is a bruja and so she kept on manifesting um, October 31st Halloween for the baby's birth and the second I got off the plane, I literally uh, went straight to the hospital and we stood there for a little while. Yes, we were. I went in on Sunday, the 28th, I believe it was. And he was born at 2.36 in the morning on Halloween. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was not that quick, but still super fast because you have all these months with them just growing inside of you. And then all of a sudden it's like this is happening right now. Mm. Um, and I had all these dreams about how it would happen and it happened exactly the way my dreams went. Mm -hmm. So it was very, uh, I don't, it was interesting, I must say. Um, but I was surrounded by his father, my mom and my godmother. So I felt full of love and mm. I was happy that everybody was there. Um, it was a <laughs> semi difficult labor. Um, mm -hmm. I had low amniotic fluid and I was contracting like every 30 seconds, but I wasn't dilating. It was a lot, a lot of pain. I tried to use all of my techniques from my birthing classes about breathing mm -hmm. and walking and <laughs> the medicine ball and everything. Mm -hmm. I tried everything. And at the end of it, I, ha I broke down and I asked for the epidural. And it was like the best thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. And it, it was, changed everything. I know it was hard uh, for her because, of, you know, we talked a lot about natural childbirth, natural childbirth, and she was really holding out. And I literally had to just say, it's okay. It's okay. You're in a lot of pain and you've been like holding out. And I was does crying not, about it. <laughs> it does not lessen you as, you know, a mom to have to do this, you know. And, and so she did. And it was fantastic. She was able to get some rest. Oh, my God. And... That was the last bit of sleep, sleep that I got. <laughs> and then finally give birth to this one. Um, and 
she gave me the pleasure of announcing um, when the baby was born and how I announced it was... Um, they the, have an Audi. Yeah, <laughs> the baby has an Audi. Um, <laughs> because although, although you know, we, they marked male on... Um, the birth certificate. The birth certificate. As Mandy said, we don't know what their gender identity or expression is going to be when they get older um, and didn't want to make any assumptions. So Nope. And, you know, I'm trying to do my best to raise him, you know, like gender neutral or just gender fluid I guess like I don't dress him in any specific colors or you know use specific toys or anything like that like I've had him in full pink outfits you know so mm -hmm. it doesn't I try to stay with that because that's important to me that his identity is his own mm -hmm. um you know well now that folks are caught up on the birth um you know I, I definitely want to talk about like um in terms of how we're talking about like uh prevention of csa and when you got pregnant i was extremely extremely happy um that that you were gonna you know have a baby because i know that you're i mean you're showing me every day that you're a wonderful mom you're Thank just you. amazing um and uh you know like what it brought up for me it brought up some really intense feelings for me and i remember that it took me back to um when when mandy was little and how uh how much struggle like it was to be present as a as a mom um and to be going through the trauma you know and i i literally just got some books um that i'll show actually um it's really interesting i haven't read them yet but this one is when survivors give birth um i could have read that when I was pregnant yeah, and, years ago. and survivor moms, women's stories of birthing, mothering and healing after sexual abuse. I mean, these, again, I haven't read them, but, um, these books, um, I'm sure, um, share a lot of the, um, concerns or issues or, um, things that come up for survivors. And that's when a lot of the stuff for me hit like really hard. It was a fear, total fear. Um, what's going to happen um, how am I going to protect my child? Is someone going to hurt her? Am I going to hurt her? Uh, and so I thought those feelings were behind me. And when she got pregnant, it really hit me uh, in a deep way. I was, I, I got catapulted back to that time um, as if, you know, I hadn't had uh, therapy and done all the work that I've done. Um, it was scary. And I have to say that when, you know, when everybody was saying, oh, I think you're going to have a boy. I think you're going to have a girl. I kept thinking, God, please do not let her have a girl. Hmm. I kept praying for that. And I don't know, if, I don't think it had less to do with around, I think it had a lot to do with different things. Like, um, because, you know, um, I was abused as a little girl um, and that just brought some stuff up. Um, and what it means to be female, um, female identified and um what it means to be female in the world and how you know um their uh females are viewed and femmes are viewed and what sexual violence and sexual assault looks like and that conversation uh around that so i prayed and prayed and when he came out and i said he has an audi i just cried i just cried because not and, and it has nothing to do with um little boys not experiencing that horrific trauma as well in this world unfortunately that happens to everyone um, but then i guess because being a girl was my experience so it was connected to me in that way and so um but after you know he was born it, i guess it didn't matter anymore if, uh, if it was female or male checked i st another wave of panic kind of hit me <laughs> and i was like one of the things that was really um uncomfortable and scary for me was like you know changing diapers i was it make, made me really uncomfortable and i don't know if you noticed but like after you, you gave birth uh, you know i avoided trying to change his diapers for a while yeah i just <laughs> i noticed it's just really nervous you know it's just like it takes time to clean and wipe and do all that stuff and i was just like i'm not ready i'm not ready for that um and even still i've i've changed some diapers but it definitely hasn't been you know as much as you change diapers and i think i'm getting more comfortable with it but it it really does bring up some stuff around safety uh it brings up that 
horrible like thing in the back of your head saying you were abused you will be an abuser and i know that's not true and i know i have my logical mind and all that but it definitely comes up you know it definitely comes up so and speaking on that too um when they say that you know trauma and stuff gets passed down in our dna it's funny like even though i've been very blessed to not have like experience any csa or anything like that I still find myself being extra cautious when I change diapers as well. Mm. Um, and I'm just always like, am I cleaning him too long? Like, do I, am I doing this the right way? Like, I always like worry about that myself, even though I know I have no ill intent and, and you know, whatever, but I mm. still find myself being like, let me just do this as quick as possible. So I'm not near his genitals longer than I need to be, you know, mm. like, so I find myself doing the same exact thing too, even though I'm just like, I don't need and to, I feel you know, bad about that because I feel like, maybe that was my you know my own fears projected onto you and even though you know i i went through the you know all of that stuff that you know there's secondary trauma in terms of like you know i know you love me and i know you care about me and i know that you have been a huge support in in my survivorship um and i just hope and i keep talking about this leading by fear right it's like i don't want to lead by fear and this is why i'm like I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, bathe him and it'll be okay. And we're going to be fine. And we're going to talk about things openly and honestly. And that's what brings us to this like topic, because again, we've been talking about this and I'm reflecting back, you know, 20 something years, right? Chulito? <laughs> 20 something years. And now here we are again. So now we get to really practice, um, and even, um, you know, make better the ways in which, you know, I raised Mandy and now helping you know assisting with this little one mm -hmm. all right you got something to say walking <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> but i mean overall i have to say i really really enjoy being a mother i feel like this was the role that i was supposed to play mm -hmm. i feel complete and really happy i truly 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 love this little person with every molecule in my body <laughs> he's in my dreams i just i think about him constantly i just kiss him and smell him and talk to him and just hug him like he's everything to me and i'm just so happy that he's here and i'm i like think of myself as being so silly in the beginning when i was so scared and confused about what to do and now i'm just like i can't even imagine you not being here for more than five minutes you know like <laughs> When I'm in the shower, I'm just like, oh my God, what is he doing? Is he okay? What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> so, you know, I'm just so happy that he's here and he literally saved my life. And I can't wait to tell him when he gets older about how he saved my life. But mm -hmm. I love this little baby. See, so with that love, the love that we talk about, where we often say it's a mother's love, but I also believe that um, anyone, you know, caring for a child, whether they gave birth to that child or not, has a really intense connection love um to that child and sometimes that connection and love really makes us scared because we don't want to lose that love we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing and sometimes that's those scared things make us do things that are you know maybe out of the ordinary irrational to in the name of protection in the name of protection so um and i wanted to ask you you know in terms of right now he's still small he's you know, four months old yeah. but um you know, in two more months or down the line, you know, where you're going to be going to the gym or they have a childcare thing while you go work out or, you know, when you go back to work or go, if you're going to go to school, like thinking about when he gets to be interacting with other adults, other people that might be taking care of him, like what stuff, what stuff comes up for you? Um, do, do you like this fear, is fear the first thought? Kind of. Mm. I don't want to, I don't want it to be fear, but especially because I am in the childcare education field. So, you know, I want to have faith and trust in the people that do the same job I do the way I want people to have faith and trust in me. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, I would never hurt a child. And if, you know, and I want people to fully believe that in, you know, in their hearts that I love their child. But at the same time, this is a horrible, horrible, like this is not a fully horrible world, but lots of horrible things happen in this world. Mm -hmm. And lately I've been seeing a lot of articles and things about children being abused in daycare centers or parents abusing their children. And it breaks my heart because I could never, I'm, I'm not going to imagine or manifest it, but mm -hmm. I'm just like, I can't even begin to process how these parents are feeling. 
like their kids coming home from school and like a black eye or like their hair ripped out or something and then nobody has answers for you no one's giving you any type of comfort anything like that so i get super nervous about leaving him without anyone leaving him with anyone who's not blood family or found family because um, mm -hmm. right now like i've only left him alone with you my godmother and my cousin who's also his godmother so and even still it was only for like a couple of hours and the whole time we're video chatting and sending pictures and texting and i'm just like what's going on let me see the baby are yeah, you okay yeah. but i know in those situations i won't be able to do that mm -hmm. um so that makes me nervous but i'm gonna have to again like you were saying not lead with fear not live in fear and hope that mm -hmm. he's not gonna be one of those sad casualties and he's gonna be taken you know care of I just want to say I want to keep manifesting that he will not um, and that um, we are going to do everything within our power um, to do as much as we can in terms of educating him, talking to him about his body, yes. his agency, all of these things and how we interact with other people, right? Other people um, that are interacting with him. I think a lot of people don't think that they have um, the right or the agency to be very specific about how they want their children Sorry. <laughs> taken care of. Um, so it's like that. And our next episode is going to be about um, um, a protection plan of sorts, right? So what does a protection plan look like for um, your children? And we're going to give some examples about how Mandy and I have been thinking about what that means for a child of this age, right? Aww. Okay. <laughs> I think he wants to talk. I've been trying to talk since day one. <laughs> um, also, you mentioned like stuff on the news and, um, you know, uh, the other night I watched um, Surviving, Surviving R. Kelly. R. Kelly for the first time and it took me a while to get myself to watch it and it was really hard and I'm still processing that and I still have not watched Leaving Neverland. Um, it's intense. It's intense stuff and it's really, really got me thinking not only about what parents families caregivers and advocates you know what we have to do um to educate and protect but also bystanders it's really got me thinking about bystanders so Wa many uh, watching um surviving r kelly it was just it's I mean, mind-boggling slew <laughs> of bystanders and i you know like i'm also thinking about when when that happened like I, i'm sp specifically thinking about when aj nothing but a number came out with yes. Aaliyah. you were four years old mm -hmm. we were living in massachusetts and that was the time when i started going to therapy mm -hmm. when i put myself in therapy because that's when i could not handle it anymore <laughs> he said he's proud of you <laughs> and i remember thinking you know hearing people having conversations about ah oh, come on you know um she's of age and this and that these these conversations people were happening and i did not make that connection a like, lot of people did i literally did not make that connection and then when you really you realize how old she was and when they started you know yeah it's true you don't mm, mm, mm. You've got a lot to say about that <laughs> exactly mm -hmm. <laughs> yes you're right um so bystanders is something that i'm really thinking about uh, and in thinking about the protection plan we'll be talking about it's not just like our responsibility but how we interact with people that are always around like and are either too afraid to say something or say that's not my issue or you know i don't want to you know um say anything that will make someone angry um, and also, what does it look like when you're trying to follow a transformative justice model, right? Like not um, not calling the cops or um, relying on child welfare or foster care um, to take, you know, children away. So uh, of these bad situations, but like thinking of a long term, long term solution that does not involve um, that and also involves like uh, individual and communities coming together to um, think in a broader framework as to how to prevent and end child sexual uh, sexual abuse which is a you know it's just an epidemic it's an epidemic so what well, so it just got me really thinking and like i said i'm still processing you know surviving r kelly and i don't know how i'm gonna react to 
Um, Leaving Neverland. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, with Michael Jackson, that was definitely a, a person, an artist, an icon that I connected more to than R. Kelly. And that blew my mind. Yeah. I was also, um, when I watched um, Surviving R. Kelly, the thing that popped in my head, even though I have a son, um, you know, men, boys, you know, they do get abused as well. So I'm always concerned about his welfare as well as if he continues, you know, to identify as male, um, as a cis male when he gets older, I am worried about how I'm going to teach him about how not to be right. an, uh, an aggressor or an abuser of femmes or other people. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge thing for me too, especially when he's in his teen years, preteen years, you know, there's all this confusion, there's hormones, there's all these thoughts, you don't know how your body is feeling, you're still figuring things out. And I know that that's a, a very, it's a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a vulnerable time. And confusing. It's yeah, confusing, yeah. Confusing. And it's a vulnerable time for um, the youth to be swayed by older, um, like, what's, uh, I keep, I'm like losing words. By adults? Old, yes, by adults who are trying to like offend. Mm -hmm. It's easy for them to lure them in because they're young, they're rebellious, right. they want to go against their parents, they're curious, they're this, you know, like whatever the case is, they're gullible. I worry about that with him too. So I know that that's a big um, mission for me as a mom to make sure that he understands that both ways no was a complete sentence mm -hmm. um that he has agency over his body and that he will respect others bodies and he would feel comfortable and trust me enough to tell me if something happened that was inappropriate or that made him feel uncomfortable or unsafe mm -hmm. and whether it's somebody we know or someone we don't know, because most of the times people get abused by people they know or in their circle, mm. their family. I would want him to tell me regardless. I don't care mm. how he thinks I would react to it. I want him to know that he is my priority mm -hmm. um, above anything else. Yeah, you, you brought up a good point in terms of like, we talk about protecting our children. Yes, that's one piece. But also the other piece to that, is, as you said, is teaching him. And it's not just boys, girls too. Yes. Um, because my abuser was female. And so teaching children about um you know consent and boundaries and what that oh looks my. like and and also for him to feel comfortable enough to talk about those feelings that come up like i really want to do this thing and i don't know and 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 have a like a a better conversation about those feelings and like processing them right rather than keeping them bottled up and then later on um those feelings kind of exploding out because they have no one to talk to or process those so at, at some points very natural feelings right um but we're too afraid to talk about them so really it, it is those two sides it's like protection but also um <laughs> teaching our children yes prevention and teaching our children not to be harm doers right not because and in most cases not because they want to be harm doers it's, they don't know better sometimes because right. i know like be uh, sexual assault or anything it's like it's an umbrella term and a lot of people don't understand some things that they're doing could be considered assault or that you're harming somebody i remember this reminds me of um something i saw on facebook it was like it was an article saying a woman and her rapist are going on tour and you know talking about her attack or whatever and i remember at first my reaction was what the hell like she's on tour with the person that raped her and they're talking together mm. like what do you mean then i read it and i viewed it and it was really because it was a familiar rape and they were dating mm. at the at the time or whatever and she didn't give a clear no that she wasn't wanting to engage in sex and I guess her boyfriend didn't get the hint or he wasn't paying attention or whatever. Mm. So he didn't forcefully rape her, but you know, he raped her because she didn't want to and it happened anyway. Oh, yeah. She forgave him and a part of their healing was to go around and explaining to other people that there are different types right. of assault that happen. Well, that's an accountability process yes. that they're going through, right? Because he's he's actually having to say, I did this. And I'm uh, changing. And I'm learning. Uh, you know, I, I fucked up and, and this is how we're doing it. So everybody has their own way of healing and kind of working through that. But yeah, it's, it's really this knowledge of what it is. Because when we say sexual assault, child sexual abuse, we go to, oh my God, they were beat up and it's it was violent. totally violent. And they, although those 
things are vi- it is violence yes we identify violence as yeah and you know choking ripping right. clothes and all that sometimes, sometimes it's not like that yeah sometimes it's not like that especially as we talk about like you know how children are groomed and things like that sometimes that person is a very sweet caring giving person and um it's confusing it's actually confusing because we only see sexual assault or child sexual abuse as this physically violent act and it's so much more than that and so yeah really like discussing that um with not leading with fear leading with love and really i think the bottom line is the the um the connection that you have with your children or the young people in your life it's the the relationship building piece that i'm always talking about because if we have no relationship you're not going to tell me shit no you're not going to tell me anything. I could say, Mandy, come talk to me about anything. You know, we often say, you can talk to me about anything, baby. But we have to practice it, too. <laughs> and it's like, my mother could tell me that, too, when I was young. And even though I love my mother so much, I would have never talked to her about any of these things. Because she showed me um, very clearly that um, she has these, you know, set rules about some things. There's no wiggle room. That I didn't feel like I could talk to her and feel heard and safe you know and i don't think that was her intention i think that it was you know she was from a different generation um and we weren't talking about sexual abuse as we're talking about it now in this time with the the me too movement surviving r kelly leaving neverland like so many things that are happening people are talking about it much more and so now we're talking about it and what is going to happen with these conversations like um, lots of people are doing some amazing work out in the world to educate people more and we just got to keep on continuing that and it's on an individual interpersonal and institutional level so we're doing this you know individually interpersonally right here and we're going to continue talking about what that could look like you know what prevention education leading with love and not with fear what that looks like um, so I hope you Uh, Check us out on our next episode where we talk about what this protection plan could possibly look like for us, for Joaquin, and for you all, right? And please just like definitely send us emails, check out our YouTube, and um, send us any questions or topics you might want to discuss. We're really excited for this new season to continue on, and we absolutely love your support. Say, Joaquin, say goodbye. Adios. Adios. It was nice to see you. (laughs) (laughs) And we look forward to having you watch Joaquin grow and get educated with all of us. Yes. Take care. Thanks, y'all. Bye.